Um, so uh, I'm Sergi. I work in a very small consultancy. It has three people. We do machine learning. Yeah, it's a good name, all right? Thank you. OK, so I'm going to, this is a sales pitch, basically. But instead of for a company, it's for a methodology. So probably all of you have heard of cross-validation, and some of you may use it. So I'm going to cover why that's good, and then use that to motivate nested cross-validation, which should be more popular. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to convince you that that's the case. Um, this is a machine learning talk, so I'm going to take out a piece of the machine learning pipeline and talk about some goals that matter to this talk. So there's two goals that I care about. Like If you do a lot of machine learning and you already have some models that you fit for hyperparameter validation or you just want to compare some models, then you need to choose one that's best and go with it and put it into production or make a case to somebody about what that model is doing. And the second goal is you want to estimate how good that model is going to be when you put it into production. So it turns out that these two goals are, OK, this, this now has stopped. Weird. OK, these two goals are uh, both necessary, but to do them simultaneously is difficult for reasons that I'll explain shortly. And nested cross-validation is ex ex exclusively to make goal two better. So it's not going to help you choose models better. It's just going to use that to give you a better estimate of how good your model is going to be. That's more reliable and more something that you're going to want to have. So here's, uh, uh, whoa, I really can't see most of the plot here. OK, there's a whole, don't worry about it. So this is an optimistic version of what machine learning is like. You get some data. It's one dimensional here, which is really not true. And then you get some outputs. And you have a real function, which you've never seen before. It's in red. And you, know, you get these samples, and you fit a line through it, and it works really well. And this is a complete lie. Don't, but this is what we use to motivate our lives. So the, we, we fit a model to this data, but usually we fit a bunch of models to data. And, and you know, sometimes they're bad in different ways. So this model is underfit. We should have used the polynomial. We used the linear model. This model is overfit. We should have used a three or four order polynomial. We instead used something like 12 order. And you know, but so usually you don't have these nice plots, so you have to programmatically choose the best model. You can't just eyeball it. And the goal is to choose a model that generalizes. And wow, this doesn't have a lot of range. OK, so I have to stand here. So it turns out that training error is really misleading. And training error is when you take the training samples you have and evaluate your, your, the model that you fit. Maybe it can detect underfitting. So here the training error is really large, and you can tell that this is a bad model. But what it can't do is it can't detect overfitting because it, you know, you're evaluating the data you used to fit, so the model fits that data really well. So to do that, you, you need to just hold out some of your data. So this is the, the first thing you do. You hold out some of your data for evaluation purposes to help you choose a model. And here's how that works. You start with a whole bunch of data. You split it up. If the data has no structure, you split it up randomly. If it's a time series, you split it up by time. So this is you know, Monday through Friday, and this is Saturday, Sunday. You fit some model on your training data. And then you evaluate your model on the validation data. This is all very standard. And then you do this for five models. And you decide that the model with the lowest error is the best model. And now you run into a little problem, which is this 0.4 error is actually not a good estimate of how good that model is. And to understand that, we have to recall what our goals are and why they're interfering with each other. So the first goal is select the best model, which we just did. And what I just showed here is a completely legitimate way to select a model. So that's not a problem. The problem is that we want to estimate how, best, how well the best model generalizes. And when we try to do that, we, we can't do both at the same time. So this, we can't use the point for. And the reason is because that error estimate is biased. And the nature of this bias is a little tricky. And the reason it's biased is because it's the lowest error we found. So we took the minimum, and then we said the minimum is a bad estimate. So each of these individually is a good estimate of their model, but the minimum is not a good estimate of the, of the true lowest model. And to understand that, we have to think of generalization error as a random variable. So imagine these are distributions of the generalization error of four different models. In some sense, the mean of these distributions is the true generalization error. So you have these three models, A through C, that have the exact same generalization error. They just have different variances. And what makes you get a different sample? It depends what draw the data you get. So there's a true but you know, infinite data set, which we don't have. And instead, we take samples from that data set. And thus, we get samples from this curve. So really, what we want to know is which curve has the smallest mean. And to do that, we take a sample. And to do that, we cut up our data. So here's one example of a sample, OK? 
So we sampled this blue line, this red line, the yellow line, and the green line. And in this case, everything worked out really well. Is we sampled the green line, and it happens to be the lowest. And we chose that one, and it looks like the green line is a pretty good estimate of the mean. So if we do find the correct model, then we actually have a good estimate of the generalization error. However, that's not always the case, right? Sometimes we do something like this. OK, now, this is, now the yellow line happened to be the lowest one, which is wrong. But it's possible, because we have randomness. And look at this. This is a terrible estimate of the mean of the yellow line. So if you use the, the lowest error as an estimate of that model's error, in case that's the wrong one, you're making a horrible mistake. And when that, this model goes into production, you're probably going to get something closer to here just by chance. So we can't use the held out error to estimate generalization. It's dangerous for these reasons. So if you, if you get it right, it's fine. But if you don't, it's really dangerous. And oftentimes, we get it wrong because we don't know what these are, how these are actually shaped. We don't know the variance. So we have to hedge our bets. And the way to hedge your bet properly, oh, I guess we don't need that, is to do a test data split also. So this is, this is actually the, the most traditional way to evaluate your models. You have training, validation, and test set. You apply all four models on the training set, one at a time. You apply all four validation, all four models on the validation set, one at a time. You choose the one with the lowest error. And then you apply only that model in the test data. OK, now this is a completely legitimate way to both choose a model with the validation data and assess its generalization performance with the test data. And here's some scikit-learn code to show you how easy this is. You do a bunch of imports, pretty standard. You load up a toy data set. You can stick your own data set in here, and it'll work fine. Here, we have to remember, we have to have three different splits, right? So we need training, validation, and test. There's a function called train test split, which if you give it a data set, it'll cut it up into two parts. So we have to call it twice to get three parts. So first, we cut up x and y, which is the features in your output, into something that has both training and validation and just test. Then we take what has training and validation, and we cut it up again into training and validation. Now we have these three sets, like I described. And in this case, we're comparing four random forest classifiers. But you can stick whatever you want in here. And what differentiates them is their maximum depth. So it's a for loop. For each of the maximum depths, I fit a random forest classifier. I, you know, I fit it on the training data only. I get its error, and I store it. So that's just very simple. Then I find the best one. So here, this is the model selection step, right? I'm not evaluating the generalization. I don't actually care what the error value is because it's biased. But down here, I refit the random forest using the best depth on the training and validation together. And this is my test error. So again, this is the, valida the validation data is used to select the model. And here, I assess its generalization performance on the test set that was not seen during these two portions. So that's just an example of the code example of the, of the figure that I showed earlier. OK, so we, what we haven't done is accounted for the variance, which you saw in the width of the various Gaussians I showed, of the fact that we're taking a, a random split. So if I, instead of doing this, if I do this, what happens? Do I get a different, do I get a different model? Does, I mean, is that important? I mean, it could be potentially important if the variability is very large. So this is what people talk about cross validation Instead of just doing one split, they do a bunch of splits to account for that variance. And if you take multiple samples from that Gaussian, you'll get a better estimate of the mean. So let's take five-fold cross-validation. This five is just an example. And go through what it does in the same kind of framework. So our, our tools here are just the training data and the test set. We haven't done the validation split, and we get some model. So you, you split it up five times. Before, we just had this upper row. That was what we had in the previous uh, figure. We had a one validation split and all this training. But now we do it five different ways. So each sample participates in, as part of the validation fold at least once. Actually, here it's exactly once, but whatever. <clears throat> and then we fit the model, the same model, five different times. And we get five different errors. And now we have five samples. And we just average them. And that's our now way to choose a model. Instead of having just one, we have five. So we're doing a better job, less variance. Um, and this is what it looks like overall. So, so far, the test set hasn't been used there, if you notice. So we have this box. I'm going to call it K-fold cross-validation box. I just showed you how it works. You give it all the models you want. They all go through your K-fold cross-validation procedure. Then you have a selection criteria, which says, what's the best cross-validation error? 
but we don't trust the capable cross-validation error for the same reason I described before, so we decide what it should be on the test set which we haven't seen yet. That's it. So this is, this is capable cross-validation. It's very popular, everyone uses it, and this is kind of where people usually stop. So let's take a look at the, the code for this. It's even easier because scikit-learn is really good at giving you tools to simplify complicated um, data splits and model evaluations. So imagine we have all the imports from before. Now we don't have to split into training and validation and test. We just have train and test. We import this thing called grid search CV, which does our cross-validation for us. This is the parameter grid here. We we're again, the random forest with four different depths. We instantiate the random forest. And then we give the grid search CV a random forest or whatever model you want and a parameter grid in this five because we're doing five volt cross validation and you fit it. And when you say fit, it does the splitting and the fitting for you and does everything you want. And then at the end, we retrain on all of the training data using the best parameters. This is a little bit of black magic where you just get the best parameters from this cr cross validation grid search thing and you just retrain. So this is the example to do, grid, to do cross validation. So this is the second way to do things. So we, I just made a case that you have to do cross-validation because you have v validation set variance, and using the exact same argument, we can make the case that you should be doing something else because you have test set variance. Right now, we still have only a single test set, so the argument sort of makes itself is, you know, what happens if we choose a different test set? I mean, what, did we get a different model? Do we get different generalization performance? It's kind of unclear. So basically, just do what I just did in another way. That's why it's called nested, because you're doing another for loop on top of the for loop you're just doing. And it's very straightforward. So this is called fourfold outer, k-fold inner CV. So we had five folds cross validation, but you also need to split up your test set. OK, so this is how you do it. Blue blocks are training. Gold block is testing. So we instead before we just had this. This is the only thing we had before. Now we're just going to do all the samples are going to participate in the test set instead of just whatever 20% we happen to reserve. And if you remember, we had this slide before. You took the blue blocks, that was the training data. You gave it to a k-fold cross-validation block. You tested all the models you wanted. You did model selection using this cross-validation error. And then you did model generalization assessment using the test set. Well, the, I mean, the story just basically writes itself. You're just, everything's the same. You just use a different set of blocks to decide what you're doing. And now maybe you're choosing a different model, which is kind of weird, because before we had one model. I'll talk about that in a minute. But you just do this four times. OK, so we just, what did we just do? We just repeated our entire procedure four times. This could be 10 times. You know, that you can sort of decide that based on what it is you're doing. And what did we gain, and what does it mean? Man, who makes these things? All right. Um, so if we do n outer k inner nested CV on m models, then we have to fit a total of n by k times m times. So if you're just doing cross validation, it's just k by m times. So the price you pay for this is you multiply all of your computation by n. So maybe if you're spending five hours, you'll have to spend 20 hours, which may be unacceptable to you. However, they're both embarrassingly parallel. So if money is not the issue, it's just computation, then you can just pay four times more to get something that's considerably a better estimate of both what models you should be choosing and also how good they are. So maybe nowadays it's not that big of a deal. And what is it good for? I mean, I sort of alluded to this earlier, but I think it's important to think is, you know, with k-fold CV, what do we get? We got one model, and we got an assessment of its generalization performance. Now we're getting something weird. We're getting as many models as we have test set splits, which might be different ones. And we have four assessments of the generalization performance. So before I got one model, I could just put that in production and say, this is the best model. Now since I have four test sets, those could be four different models, which is a little confusing. You have to sort of decide, do, what do I do? Do I put them all into production? You know, um, it's, it's not clear, but there's a lot of good options. Let's say those models are very different. One of them is random forest, and one's a linear model. You could just put the linear model in the production, because obviously the random forest isn't that much better, because it would have otherwise done as well on that particular split. So it gives you some flexibility, but you have to make more decisions, and it requires a higher level of understanding of what your models are doing. Um, and again, it's, you know, it, so what, what do we just do? We got four estimates of generalization performance instead of one. Not only do we have a better idea of how good it is, because four samples is better than one, we also have an, a notion of variance, which we didn't really have before. So you can, you can have more idea of how the model might fail in production. 
which before we really didn't know. We just have one sample, which is very limited information. And what do we do with the best models? I just like to ensemble them. It's kind of a hedging your bet type of thing. You have four models, they're different, they probably have different hyperparameters. If you ensemble them, you're sort of guaranteeing some amount of robustness against different types of data that you might encounter in the wild. If they're very different, then you're guaranteeing more robustness. If they're all very similar, then you know that the model is particularly doing a good job. So there's different things you can do here, and that's only feasible if your production environment can handle you know, something that's uh, multiplying the number of models you have by three or four, which not, everyone, never, none of them, all, not all of them can deal with. So let's take a look at the code for this. Um, it's even easier because, like I said, like the more complicated thing you want to do, the less code you have to do in scikit-learn. So you have your imports, same before. Load your data, same as before. You define your random forest classifier, identical. Here is your parameter grid, the same. And these two lines do nested cross-validation for you. The first line is as before. You have your grid search CV. It takes in your estimator, your parameter grid, and your cross-validation number, so five. And then this is the sort of magic part is the cross-val score function, when you give it an estimator, instead of giving it like a model or a classifier, you actually give it the grid search CV and tell it to do fourfold cross-validation over the full data set, and it does nested cross-validation for you. So this is all of the code. So the complexity isn't really in the coding. And this is the result that you get here, depending on your random seed. So these are the errors. So basically the errors are from zero, which, because this is a joke data set, to 6%. So imagine this was your actual life and you happened to draw this test set, you would have a vastly optimistic notion of what test performance you can expect. This is by chance. And this now tells you some notion of variance. So you could imagine in any of your applications where you have a single test set, you could be landing on any, any one of these numbers or in between them. So really you should do this if you can afford it. Um, and on the, on the idea of affording it, I presented three legitimate types of validation, and they are not all possible in all cases, so here's like a little cheat sheet of when you should use them. So if your data is small, as in really small, you should always use nested cross-validation. Bas there's basically no reason not to, and it only has advantages. Like, and by small, I mean medical data, a couple thousand patients, maybe 50 features, 100 features, something that really is, is relatively small. If you have medium data, something, let's say 100,000 rows and 100, 000, maybe 1,000 features, then it sort of depends on what you're doing. If your models are fast, maybe from scikit-learn or XGBoost, not, then you probably can do it if you can wait two days. But you might not be able to in case your models are something like deep learning, which is much slower. Or maybe you just don't have the compute. So then you just do uh, regular cross-validation, not nested cross-validation. And in, in the big data regime, people don't do cross-validation at all. They have a single training validation test split because they have five million samples. And you just kind of train only on this, validate only on this, and test only on this. And people are satisfied with this because everything else is impractical unless you're Google or something. So this is kind of what you should be doing. And really what I'm speaking to is the audience that has this kind of situation. I deal a lot with medical data sets and I've always found that NESA cross-validation gives you a really good um, additional insight into what the data is doing, into what the model is doing, and has no downside. So it's a 100% win. There's no hidden costs. You will, there are no side effects. It's great. So um, that is the end. Thanks. Thank you. We have time for questions. You, um, you mentioned the, the embarrassingly parallel nature of all of this cross-validation. So I think you can just specify right in the, the estimator the number of workers, right? If Into the estimator. Then you're parallelizing just the estimator, but you're fitting multiple ones of them. So, so you have to, so it's still serial. The, each estimator is parallelized if it can be, like a random forest. But then you're still doing it in serial. So if you, but you, you could parallelize further if you have multiple machines. You can't use the magic that they use there. You sort of sure. make your own test sets and send it to different machines. But yeah. Okay. I was, I was just going to ask if you knew of any nice pipelines that made that. Uh, not really. You can always roll I, your Not off the top of my head. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, would you suggest that once you have the data set that you're working with um, and you understand the shape of the data that you're dealing with, would you suggest that this kind of technique will be more helpful if you 
if you are unsure of the variance in the data set that you have, or would you recommend this with any regular practice that when we are running models? Yeah, I think the latter, because you, you don't know the variance of the model and the data. So you, you might have a data set that you're very familiar with, but you might not have any idea how, what happens when you fit the model. The model could be very high variance depending, you know, maybe one sample difference and your model does something vastly different. So oh, okay. that could happen, because the models behave unpredictably on data. There's just so many ways to combine it. Thank you. Um, uh, initially, I alluded to um, uh, the, the costs for doing cross-validation. Um, in terms of uh, big data, uh, doing validation on the big data, so why not just uh, take a, say, a small um, uh, a data, uh, sample size of the data set, perform cross-validation to get an idea of the best model? Or um, I guess what I'm basically trying to ask is how would you um, select the best model when you're dealing with a, when you're doing a, uh, trying to find a model for big data itself? Yeah, so here, what, what people are relying on here, and this is not necessarily the case, is that if you have really huge amounts of data, then even the validation split is very large, okay? And so that means that the idea is if this is large enough, it doesn't matter what split I take. Because it's just, because remember, a validation error is like the sum over all the samples in the validation set, the average over them. So this is also a mean. The validation error is the mean. So if the number goes up enough, you're like, I don't care. This is a good estimate of the mean. It doesn't matter if I take a different sample. So these arguments are sort of big data arguments. If this is big enough, one validation set is sufficient. And it bears out in practice if your validation set is representative of your entire set. So let's say you have a million samples here, but they're all from Tuesday and the reality is all happening on Sunday. People don't behave the same way, then it's useless. So you have to sort of adhere to the assumptions of this, of this, is that this is big enough to capture the variability of your true data set. And you, you know, for like ImageNet, it's true, because it's an artificial data set. People collected it, and they randomized it, and the puppies in the validation look like the puppies in the test set, so everyone's happy. But as soon as you go out of this regime, all of this falls apart completely. But yeah, so th that's the assumption, is it's big enough. Any more questions? Uh, Heuristic or experimental or even analytic results for choosing n versus k? Oh, I do 10 and 10. It's expensive. I mean, as a large, should you always go sort of even numbers on each, or does it make sense to do like a tenfold cross validation and, and only a threefold test? Sort of? um, so I'm worried about the following, and this is only semi empirical is hyperparameters are a way of saying this model and this data, okay? And so if your data set gets much bigger, maybe the hyperparameters that worked on a smaller subset of it don't work on a bigger subset. So when I use tenfold cross-validation, the difference is nine-tenths, which is not that much. If I do three, then it's two-thirds. You know, so I'm like, okay, well, maybe this learning rate doesn't work when I have more data or something like that. So to mitigate that, I try to have a large n and k, so 10 and 10. But that gets expensive, because then it's 100 times the number of models. Number of models is 50. You so that's why I, you know, I do it here. And then it's okay, I sort of say it's OK to be lazy for medium data, because I just can't wait that long. It's, it's not realistic. Yeah. Thank you, Sergey. <laughs>